The sound of that trumpet will cause the human beings to fall into a swoon, almost like they're drunk, but they won't be drunk. There will be trauma, confusion. Mothers will abort. And the opening of the graves. And everyone that went into a grave from the day that, they, that this earth was created, from the first human beings to the last, the graves will be opened up and the human beings will come out of the grave as if they were mushrooms. The prophet said that Allah will send on that day after he destroys the earth, after he removes the sky, he will then send clouds, new clouds, and those clouds will have inside of them sperm. And when those clouds open up and drop that sperm, that sperm will hit the earth and each one of us, the sperm from our father, the same sperm with the same DNA from our father will come from that cloud and hit the ground and you and I will come out of that ground like mushrooms. All the way back, God says, to the fingertips. That means with the same fingerprints and the same DNA. The only thing on that day, no one will be able to speak. Wouldn't that be beautiful? <laughs> no one, no one will cry, no one will complain, no one will lie, no one will exaggerate, no one will blame the other one because no one will speak. The prophet then said, peace and blessing be upon him, that the human beings will then be gathered on a huge white plain, stretched out. All the human beings from the first to the last, from Adam, alayhi <coughs> salam, from the prophet Adam, first man, all the way to the last. And he said they will be on that day barefoot and naked. No fancy clothes that day. No fancy shoes. No fancy clothes. Nothing to distinguish them and say what their class or their rank would be that day. So his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, oh messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, won't the people be embarrassed? He said, no, Aisha, they will not be embarrassed. They will be so full of trauma that day that nobody will look to the left or the right. They will all be only concerned about themselves. And then the judgment will begin and the scales will be set up. The same scales. Scales like the scales that you see inside the supermarkets when they weigh bananas and fruit. Same kind of scales. Only this day, it will not be bananas and fruit. It will be deeds. Because that's all we have as human beings to offer that day. Deeds. That's the whole purpose of our life. To do deeds. To perform. See what the tongue says. See what the private parts do. See what the hands do. See where the legs and the feet, where they go to. See what the mind, see what the eyes see. See what the mind feels and thinks. See what the heart, what kind of emotions it holds. And what's the final result on that day? The deeds will be laid out. And the people will be sorted out into groups. And on that day, everybody will be receiving their tickets and their visa to their final destination. You know what a ticket and a visa is. A ticket is going to take you somewhere and the visa is the permission. Dear brothers and sisters, seekers after truth, if you doubt that this is 
your end and my end, let me remind you and remind myself that this life is very short. The Prophet wasallam said, the human beings will be resurrected all together. Men, women, jinn, shaitanin, shayateen, beads and birds, birds and beasts. He said, they will be naked, uncircumcised, and barefooted. They will be hungry and their stomachs burning. The sun will be over their heads about the distance of a mile. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, right now, the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. And you know how hot it gets some places. Can you imagine the earth being about a mile from the sun? They will have hot wind blowing in their faces because the doors of hell will be opened up. Now, if anybody's getting a little restless here, and you think you need a, one of them little bags that they give you on the plane, or you need, a, uh, you need some uh, Panadol or something to hold you down, then let us know. Because I know most of us, we didn't think about this scenario, and I'm telling you again, this is not a movie. I'm not trying to get no Oscar up here. This is scripture giving you the chance to consider. They will sweat until their sweat will produce rivers up to their knees, their waist, their shoulders, and some people up to their noses in their own sweat. They will cry tears until the tears create a flood, but it won't matter. And when they cannot cry anymore, they will then cry blood. They will be shouting, screaming like animals, making sounds like animals being slaughtered. But Allah will not listen to them because this is a day when which was announced to them. They will have their flesh burned from the hellfire and it will smell like rotten corpse. And they will ask, they will see the prophet Adam will be there and other prophets will be there and they will be asking those prophets, look, I knew about you, can you help me out that, this day? They will be stacked up like sticks and they will have no place to stand on. Everybody will be trying to find some place to stand. They will be suffering that day so much that they will ask God, Oh God, please relieve us of this suffering. Just throw us in hell. Not realizing that the fire of hell will be a million times hotter than the place that they're standing. This will only be the beginning of the day of judgment. Dear brothers and sisters, if this is only the beginning of the judgment, let me just summarize to tell you what the end of the judgment. For those whose scales are light in good deeds, their resting place inevitably will be the hellfire. Punishments that you cannot imagine. And you may say to, to me, well, it sounds like a dream. I don't believe that. Well, you don't believe that you're going to die. You can't even imagine that. You can't imagine the grave. You can't imagine while you were in your mother's womb. You can't imagine before that. Yet all those scenarios were realities for you to get here. And all of those are realities for you to leave here. And certainly, this issue of judgment is a matter of scripture. Every prophet of God told the people about this scenario. And all I'm doing to you, for you brothers and sisters is reminding you about this scenario. All of us are gonna die. All of us are going to the grave. All of us are going to be judged. And all of us 
will wind up in one or two destinations. No one wants to be in a predicament. No one wants to go to jail, not even for a day. Certainly no one wants to go to jail for life. And even if you went to jail for life, what is it, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, in an air-conditioned prison, watching cable TV, eating three meals a day of the taxpayers' dollars, playing basketball or rugby or whatever they do in jail? But a prison of hell, there won't be no TV. There won't be no three meals. There won't be no air conditioning. There will be the recompense of your deeds and your rejection of the Almighty. Now, I'm not the one to say that if you don't believe in God, I'm not the one to say if you're not a Muslim, I'm not the one to say if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever, I'm not the one to say who's going to hell and who's not because I don't have any guarantee myself. But I'm only a warner to say to you so certainly you're going to answer for what you did on this earth with the gifts that you were given. Don't be caught by surprise and don't be in a situation that you were warned, you were told, and on that day you deny and you lie and you say that you didn't know. Because in case you didn't realize it, if you didn't know before you came here, you know now. When you walked through that door, you didn't know that you were going to walk out of here responsible that if you didn't know before you came, now you know. Now lie to yourself if you want to and dream about it. And keep this in mind. Each one of you only have a number of days or months or years before the reality of death comes to you. Some of us that are sitting here right now, a month from now, we may not be here. A year from now, we may not be here. Certainly, many of us, 10 years from now, will not be here. This presentation is to cement in your minds that true success in life has to do with understanding and making an evaluation of life itself. Make the proper evaluation. The Prophet ﷺ told us, think about your life before your death. Think about your youth before your old age. Think about the gifts of your wealth before your poverty. Think about the gifts that you were given. Think about this life, this opportunity. Think about your responsibility before you are called to account. True success in life is just like what the Boy Scouts said. What's the saying of the Boy Scouts? Who knows? What's their major, what the Boy Scouts say? What is their two words they always say? Huh? Be prepared. Be prepared. Now the Boy Scouts didn't mean be prepared to die. But it also means being prepared. Now how many people here would like to be completely prepared or some people would only like to be prepared to go to work tomorrow or on Monday. Every one of us, if we know where we're headed, would like to be prepared. Every one of us, if we're taking a trip, going to pack the bags and try to have everything in that bag that we need. Isn't that true? It is the nature of human beings that if they know where they're headed, they want to be prepared. That's the nature of what we're talking about here tonight. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to summarize and wrap up my message to you by saying part of success in life is making the correct decisions. 
And what helps us to make the right decisions is making the, having the right information. We're prov providing you with information from the Lord of the heavens and the earth, from a sacred scripture, which is the only scripture which is intact. Providing you and I with the information that will allow us to be prepared. And by being prepared, we can reform our lives now. We can rearrange things in our lives now. We can reconcile things with our conscience and we can reconcile things with our creator, with our God now. We can pay the debts that we owe. We can pay restitution that we owe. We can begin to do some worship. We can at least say, oh God, I thank you for life. Oh God, I ask you for strength. Oh God, I ask you for time. Oh God, I ask you for mercy. Oh God, I ask you for forgiveness. Oh God, give me the opportunity and I will reconstruct my life. I will reform myself in preparation for a day about which there is no doubt. There's nobody here who went to college without the expectancy of graduating and getting some kind of a degree or certificate, is it? There's nobody here that works on a job without the expectancy of getting paid. So everybody understands consequences. Everybody understands rewards and punishments. Everybody knows. So what we're talking about here is preparing yourself for rewards or punishments. Preparing yourself for recompense. Now I'd like to ask a question, a simple question. Nothing tricky about it. How many people here inside themselves have really seriously thought about the purpose of life. How many people thought about it seriously, the purpose of life? How many people have thought about the purpose of life? I mean, even for a minute, sat down by yourself in your room, walked along a road somewhere, in a church, in a bathtub, in your bed, in the hospital, when you went to a funeral, how many people thought at one time in their life, what is the object and what is the purpose of life? How many people? And whether or not you found the answer to it or not, I want to ask another question. How many people ask themselves or said to themselves, if I really knew the purpose of life, and the most successful way to obtain that purpose, I would definitely follow that way. How many people said that to themselves? That if I really knew the purpose of life, if I was convinced about it, and what would make me successful to reach that purpose, certainly I would follow it. How many people have you? said that to themselves. A great deal of people. Then I ask you the final question. How many people here believe within themselves that they understand the purpose of life and that they also are convinced about the tools of success towards that purpose. How many people here honestly can say that? That's not a significant number. It means that most of us, one thing I say, you're honest. That's good to be honest, but it's not good to be lost. And it's not good for you to be a mature human being 
on the way to death unprepared. So I tell you, every major trip, every major journey starts with what? What does it start with? One step. You got a smart man back there. One step. The first step I suggest for all of us is that we acknowledge that there is a benefactor for this life, for this creation, that there is a benefactor, there is a source behind it, there is a power, there is an intelligence, call it Almighty God, call it the Creator, call it the source of energy, call it the principle, call him whatever you will, but all of us need to initiate that step by saying, I acknowledge that there is a power, there is a supreme power, there is a creator, and there is a benefactor for this heavens and earth. How many people would acknowledge that? Yes. And if that is the case, then we can easily come to the next conclusion that there's no one that is worthy of recognition and there's no one worthy of our attention or our obedience and there's no one who has any more authority and there's no one that is worthy of worship except that benefactor. How many people could take that second step? Well, we're two steps towards a conclusion that will help all of us to understand our beginning and our end and some steps that we could initiate towards success in life. Now, if we accept the benefactor, if we accept the power, if we accept an intelligence, if we accept that there is most definitely a supreme principle behind this life, that has designed everything in it, including ourselves, then we must also accept that we human beings are subordinate. And another way of saying subordinate, that we are subjects. Another way of saying that is that we are obligated to some form of regulation and law. Now, is there anyone here as a human being who doesn't feel themselves subject or obligated to some form of legislation or law? Because if they're not, then I say get on top of this building and just jump off and see if you can defy or deny the law of gravity. Hold your breath for about 10 minutes and see if you can deny or defy the human capacity and need for oxygen. You cannot. Something even more simple than that. If you have any power over yourself, any power over anything, stop blinking right now. Don't blink. Just don't blink. Or, just don't think. Stop the thinking processes. Stop the heart from beating. Stop the kidneys from functioning. Stop the lungs from going up and down in the diaphragm. Just stop everything. You cannot. It means we're all subject. Are we all on the same page? So the third step, after acknowledging there's a benefactor, a supreme power, and the second step, that that supreme power definitely, there cannot be anyone, any other power worthy of our attention, our subordination, and thirdly, that if there is a power, there is a law, then you and I should be willing, grateful, prepared to submit 
and acclimate ourselves to it. How many people would take that third step and say, yes, we should? Like good citizens, we should. Those three statements is the same statement that we as Muslims say when we say, la ilaha illallah. That's what you said. Now we said in Arabic, a very concise statement, la ilaha illallah. That's what those three steps mean. La, there is no one other than ilaha, no other God, no other supreme power, no benefactor, illallah, except the creator, who is the one who has given all the power and we human beings are obligated to that power to surrender and to worship and to obey and to acknowledge. Muslims say la ilaha illallah. A simple statement. Even when children is born, when a mother trying to, trying to make the baby go to sleep, what is she saying to him? A lullaby. Almost sounds like la ilaha illallah. When people get happy in the church, what do they say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Almost sound like la ilaha illallah. How many non-Muslims do we have here tonight? Just let me see the hands. How many non-Muslims do we have here? Raise your hands up. If I got some money for you, you hold that hand up. Non-Muslims, nobody's going to take you hostage tonight. <laughs> nobody's going to hold you responsible for anything that you don't want to be responsible for. There's no trick to this. I don't get paid for no scalps. I don't get paid for nobody that does no witnessing and we don't have a pool in the back to dip nobody. We Muslims, we say, la ilaha illallah, because it's a concise formula that basically means those three steps that help us on the path to success in life. Because by that statement, we are witnessing ourselves, we're witnessing the world, and we're witnessing the creator, and we're also witnessing that we are subjects that's the most rational step. Non-Muslims, say with me, there's none to be recognized except the benefactor who has given us life. Say that. None to be recognized except the benefactor that has given us life. Say that. And that benefactor certainly has placed us in this earth with a law. Can you say that? And I, as a human being, I recognize and I submit to that law. That's good, because if it's only one voice among the people that raise their hands, that voice is enough. Because if all of you was a team, you would only need a captain. Now many people think that the aim of an Islamic lecture is to convert people. We don't do no converting here. We ain't got no converters. 
That's not our aim. We don't convert. We're not Jehovah Witnesses. We're not trying to make people witness Jehovah and save their soul. And we're not Pentecostals. We're not trying to save the world and save you. And we don't try to make somebody reborn. That's not what we're trying to do. Our job is to deliver the message. Perchance that that message will fall upon hearts that germinate, that benefit. Our job is to provide you with the information. Our job is to invite you to accept la ilaha illallah, that there's none to be worshipped except the creator. Our job is also to invite you that there's a human example in the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, the one that received this revelation from God. Yes, there is a human example. And I say to you, all of you intelligent, educated people in this computer age, you have the capacity and you have the ability to go to a computer tomorrow and punch in the name Muhammad, M-U, H-A-M-M-A-D, Muhammad, the first one, not Muhammad Ali, the boxer. <laughs> Muhammad, punch that name in and see who was the first Muhammad. See who he was, read his life, read his legacy. And then after that, I challenge you to find anywhere in history a human being whose life behavior and legacy compares with Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. I challenge you that if you go to the computer tomorrow and you download what information you can, if it's your father, your grandfather, Winston Churchill, your hero, anybody or yourself that you think has a legacy greater than his, Call us up on the number that's going to be on that bag that you get, and I promise you we'll raise 5,000 pounds and give that to you tomorrow. You will not find it. You won't even dare to call. Because the greatest, most profound biographers of this age came together to do the same thing I'm challenging you to do. And they came up with what they considered to be the hundred most profound human beings in history. And out of those 100 most profound human beings in history, they made what they called a categorical criteria. Now these are the most profound historians and biographers in the contemporary world. And out of these hundred human beings, personalities that they extracted, which included Jesus Christ, peace and blessings of God be upon him and his mother, included. What name do you think that they came up with? I don't need you, I don't want you to guess. I'll tell you straightforward. The name is Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, the name is Muhammad. And the principal person among those people that did that research was Michael J. Hart, one of the most profound contemporary biographers of this age. And they put it in Time magazine. <clears throat> and what do you think Michael J. Hart said? He said that based on the criteria, the categorical criteria that we set, personally myself as a Christian, he said, I would have preferred Jesus Christ because I'm a Christian. That's what he said. But he says in all fairness and objectivity, there were several categories that Jesus Christ did not fulfill in our criteria. One, he was not a father. Number two, he was not a husband. Number three, he was not a statesman. Number four, he did not leave a legacy that became after him a world government. But Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him, he was a father, 
He was a husband. He was a statesman. He left the legacy of a world government. And the last thing is that he left a scripture for the whole world. Those are the five criterias that they found concerning the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And this is why we Muslims, we have no hesitancy to say Muhammad Rasulullah. Muslims say Muhammad Rasulullah. We have no hesitancy to say that. With our love, our respect, and our reverence for Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, Solomon, David, Abraham, Moses, all the prophets of Almighty God. When we say Muhammad Rasulullah, we're giving the respect to them and bringing it all forward to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final prophet and messenger of Almighty God and the most profound human being in the annals of history. Muslims say Muhammad Rasulullah. So non-Muslims, my proposition to you is that you should acknowledge this person as you acknowledge yourself, as you acknowledge your father. Your battery is now fully charged. <laughs> I, didn't plan that. I didn't plan I didn't plan that. Non-Muslims, I propose to you that you acknowledge this person called Muhammad, the prophet and messenger of Almighty God, and the most profound human being in the annals of history. You have to know this man. You have to attach yourself to this man. You cannot leave it, just leave it open. If you didn't know anything about him before, you know now and you need to go home and you got a book there I think inside that package isn't it is something inside that package in that package you receive is there so minimally we don't say to you that you have to accept Muhammad or Rasulullah we don't say you have to say say that you don't have to accept somebody that you don't know you don't have to accept my word you don't have to accept the word of 1.4 billion people all over the world Black and white, tall and short, male and female, Chinese, African, German, French, Italian, Australian, European, American, Canadian. You don't have to accept the 1.4 billion Muslims in the world. You don't have to accept that one out of every five people in this world, they say, Muhammad Rasulullah, peace and blessings be upon him. But I think that you should, and you owe it to yourself to go home and read and check and verify this matter. In conclusion, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for considering my proposition. I want to thank you for the consideration of the theme, what is true success in life? If you were here yesterday, I want to thank you for the consideration of the proposition that most certainly there is a God that exists who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. I want to thank you for the consideration that there is a message from Almighty God and that message is in this scripture called the Quran. I want to thank you for the consideration of the proposition about our beginning of which I doubt any one of you have much refutation. I want to thank you also for your consideration and your patience in my discussion about the final scenario. And more than all, I want to thank the non-Muslims for their participation and their acknowledgement that most certainly there is a benefactor. And that benefactor has to be the all-powerful and that we as human beings, we have an obligation to acclimate ourselves, to acknowledge, to submit, and inevitably to worship that creator. In that, our job has been completed.